Okay, so um, my role at the CLS is as a person who works on the technical aspects of establishing new experimental techniques at the Canadian Light Source and also looking at the upgrading of existing equipment and, and the building of new equipment. And uh, for the last several years, um, the time I do get to spend on my own work has almost been exclusively on archaeological and cultural heritage material. Yeah, so um, uh, my name is Scott Rosendahl and I'm a senior scientist at the Canadian Light Source. Um, my uh, job function is the uh, min infrared beamline responsible. And so uh, what that entails is I uh, basically manage the mid infrared beamline in terms of scheduling and helping uh, users out and organizing uh, any sort of technical things that need to happen at the beamline to help facilitate uh, whatever experiments uh, show up. At. Well, I'm a chemist by training, so a physical chemist by training. Um, and uh, I don't necessarily have just one thing I'm working on. Helping organize close to 20 to 30 different user projects at any given time. And so really, uh, it's kind of a diverse field. So I see everything from bio life sciences, through agriculture, through material sciences, and including uh, some cultural uh, art history kind of heritage kind of, kind of items as, a, as kind of, a, I guess, a nice little break from uh, pure science stuff that I uh, typically end up doing. Uh, so what happened is in about uh, 2011, I was approached by a group of uh, scientists that were um, here at the University of Saskatchewan uh, in both the anatomy and cell biology and archaeology departments. And they were wanting to see if we could use the synchrotron to look at um, human bone from the 19th century um, and hoping to be able to get more information out of it than the techniques and processes they were using at that time. Um, so at first it started out as, as a, an interesting puzzle in terms of thinking of the types of things we could do with the synchrotron and which would be best suited for this type of materials. And then as things went on and we started to bring in other um, materials and items into it, and I had more time to think more about the project as a whole and not about just how to facilitate the synchrotron, it just really appealed to me because it was kind of like a detective story. Not only did I have to solve this puzzle in terms of how best to make use of the synchrotron, but now and now I started thinking about, you know, using uh, sleuthing out the knowledge about these items that wasn't known previously and trying to figure out if we could get information out of the materials that answered questions that other people had that had remained unanswered. Yeah, um, my interests actually come more from the, the conservation side of uh, a lot of art pieces and sculpture pieces and, and where it really stemmed from was um, I had a potential client wanting to uh, do some work uh, at the, on my beamline looking at uh, arrowheads and the materials that are um, basically get ground into the, the arrowheads as a result of, of use. And um, the project actually didn't go anywhere. Um, it it didn't, didn't do well uh, at all during our review committee processes and purposes. And um, being new on the job, I started to dig into potentially reasons why it didn't so, do so well and got just interested in, in trying to find more of these projects and make some more of these projects better. And uh, it led to a, a effectively a cold call to the Canadian Conservation Institute, uh, where I, I managed to speak to their uh, head of the conservation sciences, and from there it stemmed into collaboration that saw us looking at a variety of, of different artworks, um, as well as uh, 
these cultures. But that's really how, how I got into it. It was a, kind of a um, just a curiosity from a, a failed proposal attempt that uh, ended up uh, being very interesting and, and going from there. Um, let me start by answering the second, ha uh, second half of that question first. Um, so I've used primarily two particular synchrotron techniques to look at these objects. One is called X-ray fluorescence imaging. Um, and that is very useful for seeing where the different elements in your item are in relation to each other and in relation to the physical structure and boundaries of the item. And the other technique is called uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And that's very good at looking at one specific element at a time and determining more specifically the chemistry that, and the chemistry chemical environment that that element is under in the sample. And then you also can combine the two techniques where you can look at the chemistry of a particular element in a very small and localized area of the sample in relation to a different small and localized area of the sample. So this has been very uh, useful in term to determine not only the chemical processes that are going on in some samples, things like um, corrosion and oxidation, and it's also useful in looking and determining the the nature and origins of the elements. How did they get into your sample? An example with human bone, for example, is is what you see there in the bone the result of the biological processes of bone that went on before the demise of the individual or is this something that got onto the sample as a result of the burial environment or the burial practices for example or geologic processes that the bone has been exposed to so perhaps the the items that i've studied that are the, that i get the most uh intense about have been the work that we've done on on human bones and looking at um, sociological and occupational practices in the time of when the bone was uh, buried and and looking at things like occupational exposure to various toxic elements like lead for example and the other um, project that was has been really exciting is we've we've had a chance to look at some 19th century uh, daguerreotype photographs and there it's not only where we'd be able to look at the processes that were degrading the photographs over time so we could learn how to better conserve and um, uh, recover the photographs but then we also um, found ways to um, recover the photographic information that's on some of these silver plates that is no longer recoverable because to the naked eye the the image is too far degraded or completely obscure. So yeah, I guess uh, uh, similar to Ian when he talks about the uh, chemical mapping of, of x-rays for elements and using x-rays to determine elements. Um, I, I work in the infrared and primarily focus on uh, the molecular interactions or very low energy kind of interactions, vibrational, uh, I guess is probably the best way to describe the, uh, uh, the particular motion we're looking at at atoms within the uh, analysis that we're trying to do. And we use the synchrotron because it is um, a uh, very bright source of uh, infrared photons. It's about three orders of magnitude or roughly a thousand times stronger than a conventional uh, uh, instrument, um, particularly when we're looking at the diffraction limits, so really, really, really small spot sizes. And through that, um, I guess I, I'm going to talk probably about, uh, we'll say two, two and a half kind of topics. Um, in the sense that um, 
uh, one of them kind of expanded into uh, other looking at other materials and things. And so, like I mentioned earlier, I'm interested in the conservation of things. And so, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, a, a work by Paul Gauguin that uh, we looked at from the National Art Gallery of Canada, and it was the uh, portrait uh, Myra Dahan. And so, researchers were looking at how the um, particular uh, sculpture or carving uh, was preserved. And so the artist, uh, Paul Gauguin, typically used beeswax. And so the question was, was that, was this beeswax used as a encosta method or was this uh, used as a, a kind of a varnishing tool uh, on uh, this particular piece of work? And so uh, they basically excised a piece of the uh, sculpture uh, and we were able to do uh, infrared mapping to determine where uh, the beeswax was in relation to the pigments. And uh, we were able to determine that, uh, yeah, no, it was, wasn't used as an encaustic technique, it was you know, primarily used to, to protect the painting. And so uh, they were able to protect the work and so they were able to um, adjust their uh, conservation techniques accordingly for that. In addition, uh, most recently, uh, looking at uh, a couple paintings, uh, in particular, uh, I'll talk about the work, I guess, by Bill uh as well as a, another Canadian artist that is uh, known uh, as Lord Harris. And so uh, we basically looked at a problem that these paintings are suffering. And so uh, one of the issues is, is that the pigments and the medium that are used, uh, they could potentially form what are known as metallic soaps or soaps. And these soaps uh, result in paint flaking, chipping, um, having all kinds of issues, uh, in some cases not setting properly, like uh, in, in terms of the red electron paintings. And so uh, we again looked at small little paint chips of these guys, and we were able to determine uh, where these zinc soaps were forming and how they were causing the chipping to to occur and again how best to adjust the climate and environments that these paintings need to exist in and so uh, those are kind of some fun conservation work uh, that, that we've done um, aside from that looked at uh, dinosaur skin uh, uh, as, as a dinosaur bone, um, as well as uh, some pottery. And again, looking at how different potteries were uh, were fired uh, and the materials used in those potteries. But so, yeah. Okay, um, so I'll start by on the museum end. I think the really important things that the museum people bring to these projects is they know what the most important questions to ask are about a particular item. Um, because what that question is, what's the really truly important question of, about an item could define what is the best scientific technique to investigate that item with. So if you take the example of a painting, for example, um, uh, the technique uh, we you might be different say for example if you were trying to um determine uh if there was uh, an abandoned painting under the original painting or for example if you were just trying to determine if this uh flower that was originally painted was truly yellow when it was initially painted or if it's orange because the the um, the arsenic in the paint has oxidized and so the color that you see has changed. Um, the other thing that's very important from the museum end is these are rare and often completely irreplaceable items. We have to take, make sure we're always taking the utmost care in terms of the chain of custody of the items and in using the proper methods to work with and store the samples when they're not being worked with. And that expertise comes from the museum people first and foremost. 
Now, the on the science end, it's like I said, you know, we provide a means by which some of these questions may be answered that were difficult or impossible to answer before. And the kind of communities, the museum community and the archaeological com community is not quite as fast as some other communities to embrace novel types of science and analysis. So it's incumbent upon us to have the confidence to give them options that are likely to give them positive results. But at the same time, we also want to be able to ensure, ensure the museum people that we're doing our utmost to also choose um, techniques that are as minimally invasive to the sample as possible, which in some scientific techniques is often impossible. So a lot of the time I try to like to focus on, you know, what can we do at a synchrotron that will be far less damaging to the item than the traditional analytical methods would be. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have too much more to add to what Ian said, because I mean, it pretty much echoes exactly uh, my feelings on the matter, is, is that you effectively have uh, people with very particular skill sets, uh, whether it be, you know, a cultural heritage, kind of a social uh, uh, impact kind of uh, knowledge, and those, that, you know, have a scientific, technical, um, kind of background and you really need the two to be able to come to get the answers that both want if, if that kind of makes sense I mean um, it's uh, it's always interesting to study these materials because they are very uh, unique and interesting um, they're, they're oftentimes inhomogeneous uh, uh, expensive, delicate, uh, you know, you have to try to tease out uh, a lot of very difficult information because it's, you know, uh, very complicated uh, matrices that these kinds of materials exist in. And from a scientific sense, those things excite me. Those are very interesting problems to, to kind of look at. But again, going back to the first comment that Ian made is that we don't necessarily know the important questions. And that's where uh, the understanding of, of what those questions are in order to be able to uh, further society uh, in whatever way that might be um, is important. And that's where collaborations between universities, uh, researchers, museums, uh, special institutes, art galleries, um, the public are all important uh, to make these kinds of uh, uh, kind of projects come to light. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just add one thing on that note, is that we've, we've talked about um, various imaging and spectroscopic techniques, both Scott and I have. Uh, I just want to mention that one of the other things that's done very often to synchrotron is, is various types of what are called scattering or diffraction techniques. And those can be very informative when you have an item that has some sort of order in it whether that be because it is um, crystalline in nature or because of the way it was made, it has some sort of regular and periodical pattern in it. Things like um, certain types of pottery materials will have this. Things like uh, woven fibers will have this. And so in addition to the techniques we've been talking about before, which mostly involves depositing a small amount of energy into the sample and observing what happens to that as a result. This, these scattering techniques are not involved so much with energy transfer, but more in terms of how the x-rays bounce off the sample instead of transferring energy into it. Yeah, just that it, there is no one magic bullet when it comes to uh, analyzing materials. And so, we offer a, a, a set of tools at the Canadian Light Source uh, to, to do some analysis, but it, there are other techniques and tools that we also rely on. And so it's important that we gather as much 
from all these different techniques in order to be able to come to a, a reasonable um, conclusion, I guess, to the, the, the question being asked. And so uh, correlative data is important. And so uh, when it comes to uh, acquiring the data, it's, it's, I feel it's just as important to get X-ray information as well as infrared information, as well as uh, UV visible information and even mass spec if it comes down to, you know, determining trace quantities of, of, of materials. And so um, really I see us as, as, as a, uh, another tool that is available to gain access to these information and try to provide that kind of uh, 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 answers to these questions. But uh, yeah, that's what I just wanted to add. Yeah.